So I'm going to go ahead and get started first. Um, we're, we're here to talk about a few uh, details on the uh, on the ML um, landscape in terms of financial crimes. We're going to start with, you know, kind of what the state of the, of the world is with AML. We're going to talk about the art of the possible and then what can technology offer. We're also going to be, you know, kind of interweaving here um, feedback from Harsh in terms of where we, we see some of the big trends that are changing uh, both how um, the cloud is changing everything and then how uh, conf you know, confidential computing is changing things. And then I think the, the big topic is actually going to be also open AI and, and Microsoft's um, jump into uh, uh, the can capabilities that are going to be unique for solving some of these problems. So we're going to talk now about the landscape first. Um, you know, there are, there are three big re regulatory changes that we're seeing. We're seeing changes in terms of AML, uh, the AML Act of 2020, the Federal Transparency Act, changing uh, how reporting and, and compliance happens there, and then ACH rule changes for um, payments and processing. Um, and, and, you know, under AML, uh, the AML Act, you know, we have new levels of focus on FinCEN, uh, financial intelligence, um, counterterrorism, and uh, reporting and oversight. Um, ultimately, we, we, we will need to be able to, to um, banks and other uh, financial services institutions will need to highlight how beneficial ownership is reported and then how transparency is going to be dictated and then how to manage the data and data sharing security considerations. So that's what's going on in the regulatory changes. On the, on the, on the geopolitical risk side, you know, we've just, it's been kind of astonishing to see FTX just continue to light a fire to billions of dollars. Um, but re regulatory compliance is still, a re and reporting is still a challenge here. The UK is slightly ahead. They require all crypto firms to be registered, um, but we still have a long way to go, obviously, here in terms of how to manage that risk. The war in Ukraine is, is coming up on a very sad anniversary um, next month. Um, but we're seeing that unified sanctions have really you know, led to increasing prosecutions. So we also see that you know, cross-border frameworks are in place to help um, both uh, central banks and as well as commercial banks and, and uh, others to find a way to um, maintain a, a solid front on the frameworks and um, you know keep sanctions in place. And then the, I think there are kind of two other really you know kind of concerning um, uh, trends as well in terms of the adversarial networks that are at work. Um, you know, we see, you know, ransomware and advanced persistent threats unabated on both sides of an adversarial network. And then we have disinformation warfare. We have AI and ML on both sides, and that applies to uh, negative media and, and, and other um, uh, battles that are being fought um, on social media, in the press and elsewhere. Finally, the, the, there's a potential recession on the horizon. And you know that typically uh, triggers an update, an uptick in financial crimes in general. We see more sophisticated attacks, multi-silo, international, and and so we're starting to see different um, patterns of behavior that we'll need to identify, um, uh, highlight, and prosecute. So now let's let's turn to um, you know the uh, discussion of what the AML legislation is going to and what impact it's going to have. First of all, we have a codification of risk-based approaches um, that, that you know that, that we can actually embed in uh, machine learning, Boolean, and graph algorithms for for higher accuracy, and, and importantly, lower false positives and and more complete documentation and collaboration. We're seeing the modernization of of platforms and systems inside banks and other financial services institutions. We're seeing expanding enforcement. Um, process improvement, higher quality documentation, better SARS, and, and more um, on the disclosure side, the ability to balance and de-risk AML programs. Finally, we see short sharing and coordination and collaboration, and then the ability to increase, again, false, uh, increase accuracy and decrease false positives and escalate and resolve investigations with as little friction and risk as possible. So now let's, let's, talk, let's talk about, you know, kind of like, let's take a step back and look and think more broadly about Kind of financial crimes is a spectrum. It, it, it goes all the way from money laundering to fraud to market abuse to insider trading to tax evasion, and so you can see that there's a lot to be covered there. But um, one of the, the themes that's that's underlying all this is the connectivity between behavior, 
um, uh, beneficial ownership and um, crime rings. Um, so we see we've seen a progression in terms of the, the amount of fines that have been paid by banks since the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Um, that's a very steady climb of 17 percent per annum. But I think one of the things that's important to note here is that, you know, yes, we see $14.2 billion in, in um, bank fines in 2020, mostly in the AML breaches. AML is really three things, right? It's placement, layering, and integration. What that means is that, that there's a, a deception, and then there's a, an attempt to conceal that deception, and then there's an attempt to, um, to turn that deception into, into something that looks legitimate. So, so there's this, this, these, uh, these three um, stages of money laundering. They're, they're uh, an important part. And again, the, what the theme here is connected behavior and connected outcomes are, are where we start in our approach to um, thinking about AML in 2023. So, so, so here's some considerations. One of the things that's it's, it's, uh, surprised me when I first put this slide together was that you know, it's, it's, it's up to $2 trillion dollars in global GDP, you know, two to five percent of the of the global um, money laundering. Uh, it's not just banks; it's retail, casinos, real estate, human and drug trafficking, terrorists, and others. And you and we mentioned earlier in the in the in the, in the talk about how uh, CTF counterterrorism uh, financing is is really a focus here. But it's not just risk scoring. Understanding connected behavior in space and time is needed to find financial crimes, financial crime rings. And, and crime rings are why it's not just KYC. Effective inter investigations require knowing your customer's customer. And it's not just humans. We're, we're bringing together different elements of a solution that involve graph analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Harsh is going to be talking about you know, that topic in just a second. But we're here to help investigative teams do their best work so they can actually help powerful things happen. Next slide. Okay, I want to talk about the Federal Data Transparency Act. It's part of the National Defense Authorization. It had bipartisan support. It affects the uh, Treasury Department, SEC, FDIC, Fed, the, the Comptroller, the FHFA, the, the Housing Agency, the Bureau of, of Consumer Financial Protection, and the National Credit uh, Administration. It, it, what happens is that we can expect a higher degree of transparency, and then we're, what we're, what, where we are right now is working through the eight agencies that need to come up with the joint rule. And so we're, you know, we're, we expect uh, finalization of that. I think the key here is that we're going to see better reporting standards, better data quality considerations, and, and more powerful uh, enforcement. Now, let's talk about um, specifically about fraud impact for a second. Next slide, please. JP Morgan paid almost $2 billion uh, to report the, the Madoff Ponzi scheme. Um, so that's, that's ginormous. HSBC settled claims with regulators um, with penalties almost also being $2 billion. And so what we're, what we're seeing is that, you know, there, there are, um, the, the impact of financial crimes is huge. The risk to re reputational risk and, and non-reputational risk for financial services institutions merely, you know, starts to uh, make a profound difference. So, so now that we've kind of drawn the outlines of what 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 things look like, let's 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 go ahead and, and start to ask Harsh a few questions. And so, so one of the things we wanted to do was uh, from the from the Microsoft and, and kind of industry perspective, Harsh, what what are you seeing in terms of the codification and modernization about machine learning, Chat GPT? Where where where, where what, what are you seeing there? Sure. Uh, thanks, Michael. And first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And I guess as you were talking about the financial crimes and the new regulation coming, rules, et cetera, maybe I can share what I'm seeing when we are talking to our customers a little more broadly in the world of uh, AML, financial crimes, KYC. So a couple of things. Obviously, we all recognize, and this is not new, that there is intense desire to leverage data and AI, both internally on your own assets, as well as data that is, but also leverage open public and other data aggregators uh, goodness in terms of the data assets. Yep. But we all know that the privacy challenges, you know, whether it's GDPR or other local jurisdictional controls, 
and intellectual property protection, et cetera. Those are some of the impediments in leveraging that data and improving the accuracy of uh, you know, catching bad actors or looking at who are the ultimate beneficial owners, et cetera. So a couple of observations. And when you're talking about, you know, for example, like confidential computing, we have spent enough energy on de-identification, re-identification, anonymization techniques, but we also know there is loss of context. There is challenge of performance sometimes. So on our side, we have invested deeply into, and there is of course a whole industry consortium. We are founding member of confidential computing that is. On Azure side, we have invested heavily on what we call the CPU and GPU based memory encryption for data protection in use. What does that mean? Very briefly, we all know that data at rest is protected data in transit or movement is protected. What about when you're running your algorithms, running your large models, your applications? So that's the last leg of the journey confidential computing addresses. So ultra secure enclaves, where, whether it's Intel or AMD and now NVIDIA, the memory chip is protected. And that gives you these confidential clean rooms where multiple parties can host their data, cross train their models. And that's becoming very, like, there's a lot of attention to that architecture. I can talk about that a little more in detail later on, but that's one of the observations or what are the customers telling us I wanted to share. Happy to get into it details later or if there are any questions that come up well, I, I think it's fascinating that my, Microsoft has made so many investments in, in some of their hardware commitments um, for Azure. You mentioned uh, confidential computing, a uh, combination of CPU and GPU uh, encryption. Um, obviously, the uh, the focus on uh, open AI is, is, is really powerful. And, and, and the fact that they were taking great advantage of all the GPU and FPGA capabilities that are part of the Azure infrastructure was really exciting. Where do you see that going? Great uh, question, comment, Michael. So, as you know, we are working with you guys also on mm -hmm. making some of these toolkits available on Azure Marketplace for folks to experiment. So, I think some of the uh, like you know early observations, customers are very much interested in leveraging these kind of toolkits to see if they can train their models on other data sets of importance. For example, like open corporates or open beneficiary or type of public data sources. In some cases, even mixing their own internal data sets on these confidential enclaves. To give you an example, right now, I cannot take the name of the organization, but I think we can all guess, you know, folks who run $1 trillion worth of financial transactions on their network daily. What are they trying to do? Working with the member banks, they're looking at how do they train their models on some of these messages where they can detect nefarious or fraudulent activity, but also then let their trained model be further trained on banks' data. And the banks are looking at how can I leverage this model or my own models in this confidential kind of A, B, and B, as I jokingly call it. <laughs> yes. So there is collective and richness in terms of insights. Now imagine some of the use cases like KYC. As you're doing that validation, there could be external repositories of data or insights you want to bring that in. And interestingly, some customers have asked, where is the cousin of chat GPT that is FSI focused, like financial crime GPT? Yep. Seriously. So where, how are they looking at this? Could this be a mechanism we have com combination of confidential computing and federated learning across, of course, you know, hybrid multi-cloud situations. How can they leverage chat GPT to come up with some answers which may take a lot of time? So it's more of like, you know, do more with less and automation of some of the processes for financial yep. clients. Yep. Um, the other use case which is becoming hot is okay, how do I develop a deeper relationship with my high network customers? 
Uh -huh. And the third one, obviously, like, you know, we have Office 365 data. How do you leverage that? And Scott, we talked about in the past, how do we leverage that for insider risks? Identification of rogue traders, looking at the team's chat logs or the email and other Office 365 data sets. So those are some of the emerging patterns and use cases customers are experimenting with. And Harsh, you mentioned a, a good point there is we've got a lot of folks from some fairly diverse industries, not just banking, but it sounds like what I'm hearing you say, and you know, we can verify out in the sort of the, the installation world is that whether you're in insurance or you're a casino or you're capital markets or you're a commercial bank, it really doesn't matter. The connected data history, the ability to use Microsoft platform and, you know, whether it's a hybrid cloud or all Azure that, you know, significant dollars are being spent by Microsoft, right? You know, hundreds of millions and, and such in this market to quite frankly facilitate is, I mean, that's what I'm hearing you say, correct? Yeah, Scott, actually you touched on my healthcare neurons a bit here. So yes, another interesting observation, some of the insurers are looking to get into health data platforms. Genomics data, which yep. needs ultra protection in terms of confidentiality, privacy. So this combination of or the cocktail of confidential computing augmented with federated learning and of course with the governance and risk controls in place, in our case, of course, with uh, technology like Azure Purview, for example, or Microsoft Purview, as we call it, that gives you implementation of these policies at runtime, making sure, you know, when you're doing multi-party federated learning, what are the contractual obligations or risks you might run into, for example. And this triangulation of banks, insurers, healthcare payers, providers, they're really looking to leverage this, I would say, this augmented architecture, the framework, and the technology behind it to get into deeper and personalized insights on one hand. So there is a pivot to growth story. There is a risk mitigation story. And then there's the business operations optimization story. That's how I'm looking at it. But you're very, uh, you said it very well, Scott that it's not just limited to financial crimes or AML anymore. Well, I, I think that what's interesting, and, and this is, the, this is where, we're going to, where we're going to turn the, the conversation next to, is, that, is what we're seeing is kind of the intermingling of um, machine learning, graph analytics, AI, and humans in the loop. And what we, what we also see is that, you know, kind of with, with kind of themes you were talking about in terms of confidentiality, in terms of how to automate as much of this, there's a lot we can do here, but what I want to dig into is now let's talk about the use cases. You just mentioned that, Harsh. You know, obviously, in terms of the business cases, you know, anti-money laundering, fraud, uh, credit card and transaction fraud, trade surveillance, sanctions, ID falsification, cyber, all of this are, are really powerful. And, they, and, they, and, and, and as Harsh mentioned, it goes from financial service to healthcare to other industries. And, and we're seeing a level of complexity and a level of uh, diversity in terms of that approach, but what we see also is how to do, how to do investigations, you know, as powerfully as possible. You know, we, we at Xpero, you know, with our toolkits, really focus on the advanced visualization, how to how to understand dependencies, network pathing, uh, community and clustering detection, the network mapping from a geospatial perspective, real time data of IoT systems, and then you know, kind of leveraging the maximal. Um, capabilities of the infrastructure underneath us with um, some of the attributes that Harsh was talking about in terms of things like uh, confidential computing and then um, open AI and, and how that all complements this in terms of the machine learning analytics. We, we have patterns, we can do what if. We're also going to kind of traverse from left to right what we call the tree of pain. You know, we, there, you know there's business value that is all about uh, make money, save money and protect money. And we have strategic objectives around that in terms of how to retain and grow customers um, and ultimate beneficiaries, how we how we manage tr transaction cards. And then we have a broad array of not just use cases, but then also roles and personas. 
and we're able to span this and, and really drive value all the way through the, uh, the tree. So, so now let's just talk about kind of how we get there. And, and, and one of the foundations of our, our solution, um, you know, open AI is a large graph, right? A large language model. And graph is, is, is the way we think about it is, is how we think. You know, we, we don't just have entities in our brains. We have entities and relationships. And those relationships preserved help us track and connect and, and, and see into uh, the ability to make recommendations, predictions, and then also kind of how to intercept financial crime. So graph is fundamental to what we do, both on the AI side as well as on the analytics side. Next slide, please. Now, there is a better way, right? And and we you know we love uh, conspiracy theories, but um, what's powerful is we're also able to then um, talk about the maturity model of of how we're able to evolve. A customer's environment. Next slide, please. So, so in terms of in the face of increasing complexity, the maturity model goes from from uh, you know little to no analytic capabilities, which you know kind of represents the data cliff. And then we start to look at data connectedness. And then we start to look at you know once we're able to to move beyond uh, the data cliff with with uh, traditional BI tools like Power BI, we're able to actually make analytic assisted decisions. And so it's measurable, it's all about OKRs and KPIs and, and really kind of traditional um, uh, uh, models that apply there are very powerful, but we can go beyond that. And we can talk about how to augment decisions with graph and machine learning and AI, and then make recommendations and predictions based on that. And this is the realm of graph. We're going from uh, traditional SQL to NoSQL to BI to Graph and Graph plus ML plus visualization. The benefits are powerful. Uh, or an increase of 40% in accuracy and over 50% in 45% uh, decrease in false positives. That means that we can boost the accuracy. We start with a baseline of 5% increase with just baseline machine learning and deep learning. This is where OpenAI it might, might you know, play deep in, in a very helpful way. That's what, you know, it's harsh said. We start to increase that with graph plus machine learning insights and algorithms. And then we get another 20% with visualization and humans in the loop. And that's how we say, that's how we describe an increase of over 40% in accuracy, 45% in this case. So we're really excited about what we can do for um, big banks, other institutions, and, and all the others. We're going to now going to turn to talking about how human and machine learning and graph increases accuracy, both in fraud detection, we're able to increase by 40% here, and we're able to reduce false positives. And this means less friction for existing customers. Um, you know, I'm just so excited that, you know, as a, uh, my, my bank has not, has never reported a false positive for, on my uh, credit card. And so I'm, I'm a happy customer of, of those systems. But here's how we help them do their work. And so we can actually connect the dots and actually describe behavior in space and time that helps us in, in, increase accuracy. Now, here's some of the, some of the interesting details that, that you know, we, we're really excited about what we've done with one of our, um, one of our leading edge um, clients. You know, they, they're trying to measure total alerts for journals between unrelated accounts. And so this is actually a, a, a very... Um, uh, well-constructed proof of value, what we saw was an 84% improvement in uh, total alerts. In other words, we were able to reduce the noise and get to signal from blue to orange. And, that, and the green highlights the improvement in that. So, so we were able to reduce false, po false positives and we were able to drive better accuracy. Same thing in terms of the alert accuracy. You know, we, we actually, you know, we're able to um, close the alert with no change in risk exposure. So, so that, was, that was understood. And this is where the system surfaces an alert and then a human can quickly say, nope, that we know that one, we're, we're good to go. So this is a, this is a, a very quantitative view of, what, of how we can work with customers to drive uh, business value. Customer two um, showed, uh, again, we measured total alerts between unrelated accounts in a different scenario, and we're able to reduce that by 
And then finally, in you know, the, the last uh, uh, bake off we had was around alert accuracy. We went from three alerts to one alert with no change in risk exposure. They were deemed non-material, and we were able to, to assess that very quickly with, with, with compelling accuracy. All right, so let's talk about the architecture for a second. So we have the ability to, um, to really connect all of these capabilities um, across the system. And so at the heart of it is our Experio Connected Financial Crimes. We're able to bring in data from traditional systems like Oracle and Teradata and Snowflake. We're able to also um, work, to work with both DBAs and IT as, with a technical workbench, but we're also able to give business users a view on the lower right of how that all works. We work with um, Microsoft 365, we work with sanctions lists, we work with other uh, external data sources, and we're able to bring that in together, build a machine learning model, build the business logic model and the graph model, and, and develop a composite risk score that drives investigations in a very powerful way. What One of the underlying um, capabilities that we take great advantage of is that we have the ability to um, provide a front end for explainable and machine learning AI. So from a graph perspective, we have 70 graph algorithms that are able to um, you know, tune for your specific use case. Louvain is powerful for finding fraud, for example. Um, and so we're able to leverage that, those capabilities, but then we're also able to leverage machine learning um, concepts like um, graph convolutional neural networks, Markov networks, and probabilistic models. Summary is there's a lot of power underneath this that, that the platforms are finally starting to take full advantage of. What we do from a graph perspective is what OpenAI does from a large language model perspective, and then we're able to pull that into this as well. And so there are some key graph functions that we're able to leverage in terms of Levenstein, Louvain, Strength Connection, PageRank, these are all ways to show connection between behavior and entities and outcomes. So in terms of dependencies, clustering, similarity, we can do it, all of that in a very powerful way and, and give you a, a front end to leverage how to follow the dollars, how to find centrality. So when, when we think about the seven key data uh, science capabilities powered by native parallel graph, um, next slide, please. We're able to, to, to uh, dig into deep link analysis, multidimensional entity and pattern matching. We're able to show re relational commonality, hub and community detection. We, we can do geospatial and, and time series and machine learning uh, feature generation. And so the summary is we have a very complete and robust set of capabilities that we, we can run in any infrastructure, but especially with our friends at Microsoft and Azure. Next slide, please. Some of the uh, detailed steps in the prediction process are really about, you know, identifying a subgraph, saying, okay, here's here's a um, a, a way for us to, uh, you know, find an element of the graph that looks that highlights um, a, a possible concern. So we run we run pattern detection, then we build that subgraph, we incorporate that with new data, find the existing patterns, and learn. And then we make predictions about fraud. Summary is we start with the data that exists and we're able to add insights to that data and then build a deep learning machine learning model that helps uh, drive outcomes that are unique to our solution. Next slide, please. So we can categorize the risk factors by trade and activity. We have an unstructured graph of unrelated trades. It looks like noise and it's just, what, what, what does that mean? We, we don't know. But once we start to do automatic clustering, once we're able to do, to do similarity analytics, and once we really um, you know, apply unsupervised machine learning to this, which is what a graph algorithm does, we can actually then be very specific about what the risks are and how we actually can identify and discern and take action in our investigations and otherwise to identify, you know, here's the crime ring. We can find them and we can, we can help uh, our, our clients do the best work of their career. Next slide, please. So here's how um, Microsoft can enrich knowledge graphs. And then and we can harness uh, insights from Office 365. Harsh, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. So this has become an interesting area, as I mentioned earlier, right? So there is richness of, of course, folks who are into the Office 365 world. 
you have Outlook team, chat log, SharePoint, et cetera. And there's a whole variety of use cases emerging, whether it's like in the areas of sales effectiveness or process efficiency. I'm not gonna go through each one of these use cases, but even in areas like anomaly detection, and that could be anomaly of different kind. You know, you have Reg W for rogue traders. Can you sift through your email, the team chats and everything else and identify that kind of risk? Can you identify other type of insider risks, for example? And obviously on the hybrid workforce, uh, especially in healthcare, we have seen like provider burnout, leveraging a chat data from Office 365, and it connects very well with the graph capabilities you have. And Michael and Scott, if I may also say, an interesting question was asked recently. So how would the goodness of knowledge graph be leveraged further with emerging open AI type of large generative models? And one question was very much on, how do you improve the ML ops? How do you do explainable AI? And my response was, and food for thought for today, for the participants, that think of the requirement for AI bias, model bias, model drift, almost like model 360, or a different kind of graph. Yeah. Who owns the model? What process, what insights it generates? What are the risks of that model? So that itself is an interesting application where graph and chat GPT and other open AI models can be connected. And of course, Office 365 is one of those input data sets. Mm -hmm. but now you can see other kind of adjacent areas of graph technology, your graph neural networks and other algos could help you do explainable AI. You might need that for FDA submission on the healthcare side or you might need it in the case of explaining to a FinCEN or other regulator that how did you come up with a bad actor of high significance and high risk? So I just wanted to share some of those observations around how are the customers thinking of this cocktail that continues to, I would sum up by saying to me, human brain is the best knowledge graph ever created. Uh -huh. And literally what you guys are doing with the power of open AI and uh, these kind of advanced capabilities emerging also on the GPU side, we're trying to really get as close to that breathing, living, breathing knowledge graph or the human brain or That's the digital awesome. twin of the human brain. That's that's fantastic, Arsh. That's a great great way to, to to turn into from from the conceptual to the infrastructural. What we're showing here is kind of our reference architecture for for Azure, and so you know we have the ability to connect to all of the different data sources um, through uh, the Azure Service Bus uh, ADF. We're able to then also kind of connect to different application layers. We're able to bring you know data into the graph. And 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 in, introspect it through various um, capabilities, but we're able then to enrich it. We're able to search it. We're able to also start to leverage the Azure Synapse Analytics uh, stack uh, in terms of how we could actually do some batch processing or other kinds of work. And then we can actually connect to Azure Databricks. We can leverage Azure Machine Learning. We have the various um, API endpoints, and then we can actually tie that together with um, models that make sense. And, and one of Harsh's favorite models is the next one, which is FIBO, which is the financial industry business ontology. And it's all about uh, trying to build a map of all of the concepts and, and, and the, 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 the interconnection between those concepts is very powerful. You have business entities, you have process domains, you have uh, corporate action and events domains, and then you have all of the other elements of what, what is needed here. What's powerful about this is that uh, this really kind of gives you a road, roadmap for how to think about constructing a view of your business so that you can actually leverage the graph capabilities. Harsh, do you want to talk a little bit about FIBO? in this context? Uh, sure, sure, Michael. So <laughs> this gets interesting, right? So we started this journey on how do we all speak the language of the Wall Street, if you will? You know, where, how, how do you leverage the common vocabulary? And the journey started with some of the, as you can see on the left, I need not describe each one of these subject areas, but you can see that this cross industry within the world of financial services, of course, 
<clears throat> the experts came together and built this, what we call the business vocabulary or the vocabulary of the Wall Street, if you will. And the richness of the business concepts here was a good step forward. Now, EDM Council, the Enterprise Data Management Council, which I'm sure many of the participants are also a member of, or they might look into becoming one, how are customers looking at FIBO in a couple of different ways? One, obviously, making the machine learning more contextual in the financial sense. There are other members who are looking at how can they teach the algorithms to be more FIBO aware? And when you're doing insights, it can be more accurate. In other cases, it, it may just be data interchange across different heterogeneous systems where the FIBO vocabulary or the model or the ontology can facilitate some inferencing and machine learning, for example. So there are a couple of different pathways that have emerged and it goes without saying FIBO is continuously being enriched with other subject areas, if you will. And there are some common ones, of course, like the org structures or the, what we call the corporate action events, et cetera. But infusing FIBO ontology or enriching it with things like open corporate data set or open beneficiary, other orgs, metadata, the ontology is continuously getting enriched. And the consumption of this ontology by your graph technology, for example, Scott and Michael, as you work with customers, that's where it all starts showing up in the real world. Totally makes sense. Harsh, that's, uh, those are some great insights. Now, I think we want to talk about uh, kind of uh, handing this over to uh, Scott and, and having him uh, talk to, in, in detail about kind of our solution set and then how customers are leveraging it for great outcomes. Yeah, great setup, guys. I, I think the, you know, the sort of the core takeaway, what we're about to see then is we've heard a lot of different elements, right? We've heard that Microsoft and the platform and the cloud is changing how people are doing business. And again, whether you're in any of those banks or commercial or casinos or insurance companies, whatever it may be, and that there are specific use cases. And so what we've done is we've tried to build the best product for multiple use cases. And what we've heard you is that this accuracy and positives and the most important thing then is bolting on to what you already have, right? I don't need to throw away and I can't throw away my work. I'll never throw that away. And I'll never throw away all my stack on Microsoft that I spent a lot of money on, but how could you bolt on and bring all these things to the table? And so when you, when you look at what we've been able to do, that recipe, if you will, is what, you know, Xperia is bringing to the table, which is, I need a graph. Well, we're making it simple for you. It's, it's part of what, what we're providing here and how we, we do what we do. And, you know, we're using the infusion of leveraged income models that you may already have in Jupyter or you've got them in, you know, again, Databricks or wherever it may be, right? That's what we want to do is, is make it fast and make it easy um, to go do that. And to that end, a lot of the folks on the phone may be investigators. You may be executives. You may be IT persons. And there is a home for everyone. And so in your process today, you're most likely doing a lot of these things. But what we have seen then is if I'm a machine learning person, I need to use that math that Michael shared. I need to use that confidential compute that Harsh mentioned, right? But that's that's my job. I know that I hand that off to investigators and they don't care anything about that, right? And the takeaway here is that everyone in the stack today um, is, is important. And why? Not just because the legislation and the fines and, you know, look, somebody's boss may actually go to physical jail, which is new. Um, but we all want to be good practitioners. We don't want to spend all the time hunting. As much fun as it is writing machine learning, we want to really use that power uh, to get us going. And that's really what we've tried to do here is break it up into layers. And we're bringing to the party many of these layers at the top and the, the middle. And as you get to the bottom, again, this multi back end, and as, as the cool kids call it, the polyglot uh, situation where all of those are, are, are in play. And 
I will always use them and some may come and some may go. But the point of this is I've got to be able to, in a timely manner, make those connections, look for the insights. I've got to get better, right? Because my boss is telling me, I don't have the budget that I used to. Yeah, I get it. And, and you're an investigation team that you need to um, do better. Um, but with what? And, and that's really where we're trying to go here is let's provide in a modular way different elements um, to you. So if you're in the um, more of the IT area or you need to do KYC as a singular job function, great. We have modules for all of those. And, and I think that's the other takeaway here is that they don't have to all be part of your suite. If you have Oracle Mantis or you have Actimize or insert flavor here, it's probably good at certain things and that's great, right? So let's use it um, to go do that because in the end, this is the full life cycle. If I'm over on the right, I need to know how this all fits together. I need to know how in my daily uh, world, I can use the power of machine learning, but I don't necessarily care how to write it. If I'm over on the left, maybe I do want to write all that. Maybe I want to test it. Maybe I want to make it better and stronger for my business uh, team member. And, and that's really this sort of democratization of the combination of that one graphic that, that Michael showed us for the cliff, if you will, which is we want to be better. We want to be more accurate. And my boss um, and my boss's boss all want to do this for less money um, than perhaps what I'm doing today. And obviously, I want to be so much more productive um, in that accuracy so that we can do more uh, with that. Now, we have different modules and we'll see a quick demo here, but things like screening, right? So again, whether you're in insurance or you're in capital markets or, or wherever that may be, screening is an ongoing process. It's not just um, allowing you to become now part of my customer pool, but, but what is it you're doing? And constantly reevaluating um, you know, where you sit in the world, has your behavior changed? And more importantly, can, can we check that? Have you been linked to ad, adverse media, as Harsh mentioned in some of the other ones, right? How do we do that in a simple and easy way? Um, how do we do that complicated thing of building and training models? It seems like rocket science, but it's not. It doesn't have to be. Um, and so what we brought then is the ability to look into it, allow laypersons on the business or even in the investigation side to build their own capabilities so that their teams can be more productive. And then maybe there's a macro level um, where if you're more sophisticated and you have larger teams, right? Then I want to go build alerts. Now in an alert, I may have an alert builder today, but it doesn't use that graph capability. It doesn't allow me to combine rank uh, sort of above the line and below the line for those functions. And then when I do find it, I need to verify that it's working and it's good. And I need to create human digestible insights to say, um, this is a problem in human, you should spend your time on it, right? That's really ultimately what we're trying to do here is make those different level one zero, whatever it may be in the investigation pool, incredibly more accurate, but I need to speak in a vocabulary of the business. Then I need to, again, whether I'm using Power BI today or I'm using some Tableau or whatever it may be, right? Our widgets sit inside of those because the last thing we want to do is create a brand new user interface or something that doesn't quite fit with what they're expecting. So these can be widgetized. We can show um, co code data for Salesforce data or other kinds of elements, right? The point of this, again, is plugging in and bolting on. Um, we want to be able to bring those insights. In this case, I'm looking at communities or rings or syndicates or accounts or other kinds of elements. And then furthermore, I want to be able to see those connections, follow the trail, find a deeply linked pattern, as Michael pointed out, um, and say, this is a problem or no, this is not a problem, and then teach it um, so that I don't see it again, right? Turn down the noise. Uh, for what it is. But some of these cases and some of these fraudsters have gotten so complicated that the fraud in this sort of picture, if you will, you see the circles and the lines, they may hide at 10 hops, which in these circles are 10 circles away where the fraud starts happening. Why? Because they've gotten smart and they've gotten good. Those non-obvious relationships are what we try and help the human identify. And then how do I tie it all together? Again, you may have a case management system already. Um, and that's fine, but the data that we can find, that highly connected piece of information, 
we can insert that um, into an existing case. We can make cases stronger. We can make them more productive. We can also turn off a lot of false case generation, right? Now what we can do is we can enhance this um, and we make it more productive. And then finally, somebody needs to manage all this, right? I need to be able to configure it and manage it. And you know, you may not have an enormous IT staff, but how do either super users or other folks um, go do that? And that's really what we're trying to do. So enough talking, Scott. Let's see if we can't um, pull up a demo here. Um, to go do that here, let me pull over this over here. So in my demo here, my first stop is, is that alert. Now, lots of demos that we can show here. Um, and if you're interested, we can spend more time on this, but I'll just do a quick version. In this first example, I can simply build my own, perhaps it's a, a, an inside trading for surveillance, or you can see on there that I had commercial banks or whatever they are. But in this case, I'm saying I want to build a simple trigger, an alert. What I've done then is I want to look at different kinds. Now, I can drag and drop any of the current data that I have. I could do a region. I could do uh, a type. I could do a claim. I could do insurance. All of those are at my fingertips here and obviously connecting those. But in this case, I have dragged over an account that is a brokerage. I'm looking for any trade over uh, $15,000 in uh, crypto because crypto um, is, is basically one of the new things. But again, it's just a it's just a transaction. It could have been a wire, it could be anything else. Then what I'm saying is within three connections, look for um, somebody who may be on a blacklist and find a community, not just one person, but let's find and see if there are more than persons and are they hiding deeply in those connection patterns. Now it's a tall order, but I literally dragged and dropped this, right? I can just drag these elements over. I can type these things in. And then if I wanted to, I can just simply connect them. So in a matter of minutes now, I have the ability to do that. Now, if I don't like it, I can delete it or I can edit it and modify it. My next step is I'd like to test it. And what I'd like to do now is let's see what it does. Right. In this case, I have found that this is very, very accurate. And I've been able to uh, effectively build and test that trigger. Now I can go back and test it again. And again, I, I did no code. I'm not a machine learning person. Right. I was able to work my way towards that. Now comes one of the aha moments. Now that I built those triggers, so I could have a counterpart that's building them for anti-money laundering, for credit card, for mortgage, for any type of activity that I want. I can silo those, or in this view, I can see them all. Why? Because one of the things that we have seen in our customers have told us that the act of finding one alert is pretty straightforward, but in this case, I have found two alerts. And what I am finding then is they are using an account that has been tagged here as being suspicious and they are looking for a loan and they are connected also to a current commercial customer. Those two together are the problem. Otherwise I would have missed these because each of these in their own singularity um, would have been a problem. And so what I have found now is that the two of those, and I can see sort of the atomic capability down below where those things occur. In 30 seconds now, I have identified that I have indeed a problem. Now, I can go explore that. Um, I can see over here that the system has found, sure enough, there is a Fran Farmington that is connected to an employee. Well, that's very unusual. So now I have not only an account that got found, but I see now these community rings, which are those algorithms that were found as a community. Well, I can skip forward to the aha moment. What I have actually found is an internal employee network who was working together out of a branch. And with those algorithms, I have found that they were indeed defrauding and creating loans and they were on a blacklist, right? So in a series of seconds, I can see the transactions and all of the accounts um, that go with this. And the beauty of this is I can now, um, as you see down here, I can start to progress this. You notice there are notes down here. I can see um, when those things occur and I can now start to flag these as known fraud, so the system gets even stronger um, to go do that. Now, let's say I wanted to tie all that together, right? You see here that I have a um, effectively a case. I can go see all those different views. I can see those connections. I can see where it exists in time and space. 
um, and I can see all the interconnections. So again, in three minutes, right, I have been able to show you how wherever you are um, in whatever type of industry you're in, um, this kind of modular system on the Microsoft platform um, is fast and extremely efficient. So now let's sort of come back. We're, we're kind of getting low on time here, but but the takeaway here is as, as, as we've sort of just sort of quickly glossed through is regardless of where you are in your organization, whether you already have a system or you're looking for a system or you just need this sort of horsepower underneath your existing system, this Xperio financial crime platform in the Microsoft Azure world can be brought together. We're now trying to create a layperson capability and a technical person capability so that the, the summation of the whole is to indeed radically lower um, those false positives to radically increase the accuracy and, you know, put the power back in your hands, right? And that's ultimately how we got here. Now, where do you find all this? Ta-da! Here it is. It's out on the Azure Marketplace, and we are happy to share with you how we do that. And as, as um, Harsh and, and Michael have pointed out, um, it's simple, it's easy, it's straightforward. It starts with a conversation, right? Um, there is the capability that your use case may be slightly different, but let's have a conversation. We think that a lot of the, the things that we talked about today are vastly important and, and can be very, very beneficial um, in your uh, world. So again, whether whatever use case you may be uh, working on, et cetera. So with that, um, any questions? And back to you, Laura, for questions. Actually, so we do have a question that um, I wanted to direct to Harsh. Um, what are the barriers to the adoption of, tech, of graph technology, and, and what are what are Harsh? What are your recommendations on how to overcome? Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm sure there will be other questions for the participants. So I think you have touched upon it one or the other way, right? So who are some of the key kind of stakeholders who might be interested in overall graph technology? But how do you convince them? Obviously, chief data officers, data analytics officer, or head of data and AI are the obvious stakeholders. But increasingly, I'm seeing if you are able to connect a use case to some kind of operational or pivot to growth KPI, for example, in the area of risk, by what percentage you might be able to uh, trim some of the time in a financial uh, crime investigation, for example, through some of these automation graph plus federated learning confidential computing AI, for example. If you can demonstrate that, or of course, we are happy to uh, explore those use cases further with folks. So that's one pathway. Being able to connect, graph is exciting, people get it, but I think one of the barrier is, so what is it going to do? What KPI can you demonstrate to improve or get the check signed from your stakeholder? So I would say operational efficiencies and uh, pivot to growth, obviously compliance is a no brainer. Chief risk officer, compliance officer could be your go-to executives, but it's critical to graph is cool, but then what insights did you get? And are those insights of some value to some stakeholder, whether it's on the run the business side or pivot to growth or lower your risk? Awesome, Harsh, that was a great answer. I really appreciate it. Um, Scott, here, here's, a, here's another question we got um, earlier. Uh, how, how do we get started with a POC? Well, that's a great point. So one of the reasons why being on the Azure Marketplace is, is so beneficial is that you know it's it's easy to do. And, and if there are data concerns or things that you maybe want to start in secure computed areas or even synthetically realistic data, um, it's very straightforward, right? So it, it typically only takes a couple of days um, to get together and sort of set up where the environments are going to be inside of the Azure world um, and, and then effectively sort of turn it all on. So it's very straightforward and it's typically days and hours more than anything else. Awesome. That, that sounds great. And um, uh, I saw one other question. Um, uh, we were asked, uh, you know, one of uh, a customer says that they are or a prospect is, is saying that they are working with their Microsoft account team. How do we connect? We, we can connect through Harsh, we can connect through um, Azure, and we can connect through our, our own connections into Microsoft. So we're ready to help uh, you know, you know, our clients and our prospects and Microsoft work together to deliver these solutions through the cloud on-prem where you need. And we can actually take advantage of some of the um, 
capabilities in, in Azure that, that might be unique to Azure. So this is really exciting. I think the summary is we, we will work with your um, uh, account rep and we'll make sure we, we drive this to a successful conclusion. Yeah, Scott and Michael, you take the lead on it. We are delighted to support our partners and customers. Thank you so much, Harsh. Cool. Well, Scott, how about if you uh, go ahead and take us home and um, and uh, wrap this up for us? Yeah, so Laura, did we get any other questions? Uh, those were all the ones that I saw come through. And just as a reminder for everybody on the call, this was recorded today. So I'll be sending out a copy of the recording. It'll also be hosted on our website. Super. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we'll give everybody back uh, exactly one minute. We do thank you. And please reach out to us in any of the many channels that we have here. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day, all. Bye. Bye.